Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish, Entering the Kingdom of the Cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here. I know you all have been chomping at the bit, having to wait an entire week. We left it on a little bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, Andrew, thank you for joining us from your brand new super secret headquarters just for a couple days. I uh, appreciate you joining back, man. Oh, absolutely. I was just traveling around, you know, that last episode had me floating through Orion's belt in the plating star <laughs> system, and I'm back here now. That's a little awesome. scary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're joined back from with uh, Colleen and Nikki. How are you all doing? Thanks for joining us. We're great. great. Thanks. Thanks for having us back. Okay. All right. So the cliffhanger, and you're, you're probably wondering too, like, what am I going to talk about this picture? Um, it's interesting. You brought up some things in part one about the relationship between Ellen and James. And given that James was the promoter uh, for her and a lot of what was going on and there, it was just very interesting. So the picture, when I look at it, it's, while well, it's very 1800s-esque with how they look, and even though she's very wearing a very traditional 1800s dress, she seems to be the person wearing the pants in the picture. <laughs> yeah. And that mm-hmm. might be a little of a serrated edge, but that was in my immediate gut instinct when I saw that picture. Why, do you think that's an accurate assessment? Why do you think I went there when I saw that? Just curious. My view of things as just reading her stuff over the years and seeing how it progressed from the beginning when James had a very big doctrinal voice to the end after he died, where she could destroy men with a single dream or a testimony from the Lord. It appears to me that over the years, she became quite enamored with her own power, with her own visionary power. Mm-hmm. And she did reprimand James and correct him and instruct him. But as I said, he was older than she, and he died. Um, you know, I don't remember the exact year, but I believe it was in the 18, like 1868-ish. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> he had a stroke, and apparently he had a stroke before the stroke that actually killed him. Right. So he became less strong and she became stronger. She had to sort of carry on and push through. And she did. Mm -hmm. And she kept those power reins in her hand. And as James weakened and died, she had them firmly. And Mm -hmm. the men in the, in the, in the organization didn't quite know what to do with her. She controlled a lot of things. They had ideas of their own, but she managed them with her testimonies. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think you're right about the picture. Okay. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by HigherBond.com. I am getting married soon, but if I wasn't, I'd be checking out HigherBond.com. It's a brand new Christian dating website that takes out a lot of the awkward nuance of online dating. They have a lot of really cool features to bring back the human element into the online dating scene. One of the cool things they have is something called guided first messages, which makes the initial sliding into the direct messages. We all know how uncomfortable that can be. They've actually made that process extremely fun for both people involved and made a really fun, natural, organic way to date online to meet new people. And check it out. They currently are offering a uh, three-month trial, no credit card required. And who knows? You might find yourself uh, a wife, a husband, a hubby. Uh, significant other, whatever you're looking for, you can find it at higherbond.com. You can go ahead and take advantage of the three month trial. Enjoy the podcast. What about you, Nikki? Well, I, when you mentioned the picture, it makes me actually think about my daughter, my 13 year old. We went <laughs> to uh, Michigan for a former Adventist fellowship conference, and they have this little village there with all of these schoolhouses and homes that prominent Adventists lived in their printing presses there. And we walked through this tour and we went into Ellen White's home, by far the nicest home of all of the homes Mm -hmm. there. And as we went up the stairs, the tour guide said, look to your right and you'll see James White's room. And we turn and we look and it is the size of a closet. And then we go around the corner and we enter this large room with windows all the way around, a bed, a rocker, all of these really nice things. This was Ellen White's room. And my daughter to this day says, yeah, Ellen White kept her husband in the closet because he had this tiny little space and it was just kind of pushed off away while she had all of this luxury around her and her writing desk. And it was where she would apparently meet her handsome Mm -hmm. young man. But I do have to say really quickly, Richard is here, our tech person on the side, just Uh making sure we're like 
the right thing. And he just looked it up. And James White died in 1881. I was way off. Mm, okay. Just FYI. Yeah. And sometimes when you're, when you're on a podcast, you're just bouncing off the top of the thing. And sometimes people go and ma- microanalyze. That's just sometimes what happens. So I appreciate you uh, correcting that. Um, it's interesting because, again, when you look at a lot of similar uh, religious movements uh, during around that same time frame, usually it's very patriarchal. You have the man, the men who is leading, someone who's very charismatic like Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, Charles Taze Russell, and usually at the same time you'll also have uh, women who are viewed as almost secondary or they're used as a means to their end. It seems like in this case, it's almost a reversal of those roles. That That's kind of what fascinates me about that. What are your thoughts? Well, I think at the beginning, that kind of was the role. She mm-hmm. was the visionary, the one that he needed in order to have the the imprimatur from God to make the declarations and get the following. But as time went on, I absolutely agree. The power reversed. And by the time he died, I mean, she didn't die till 1915. Mm -hmm. So she ran that organization with a lot of tumult, but with an iron hand. And it started, it's, I do believe that started to shift before he died. Yeah. Uh, Phil Johnson, uh, in his lecture, you can look this up on YouTube. You've listened to the lecture. He said something as I was pre- prepping uh, just a couple of hours ago is that if you again if you look at a lot of the photos of Ellen G. White, she is usually not looking directly into the camera. She's kind of looking off. She kind of has I don't know. It's a little. Some of the pictures are a little creepy to be honest. To but be it seems it, it, yeah. It does seem there seems to be an overall aesthetic like I I am in the know. I have a special mm-hmm. secret knowledge that no one else has, and I think I would agree with Phil Johnson's assessment. What do we know about her, like as a person, like what, in just in day to day life? I know she had these times where she's having these grand visions and and seeing these apocalyptic visions and kind of making up this. We mentioned the syncretism theologically, which makes the whole language very very complex and nuanced, which we're going to decipher. What do we know about just her, but what she was like day in and day out? Like, what did a typical day look like for Ellen? Well, you know, I couldn't say day to day, but I do know that in general, she was portrayed as very sickly. She was sick a lot. She, she, when she was a child, third grade, I believe, um, Mm -hmm. she was hit in the head with a rock from a fellow schoolmate. (laughs) Our friend Cheryl Granger, who um, sometimes writes for a proclamation has always said, I would love to know what she did to incite that much anger out of a fellow schoolmate to hit her in the head with a rock. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting question, to be honest, but it hit her, hit her in the nose, apparently broke her nose, and she was unconscious for three weeks. So um, she probably had head damage, <laughs> brain damage of some sort. And she was very upset when she came to because she didn't look like herself anymore. Mm-hmm. And so she was sickly and the the myth, the internal myth is that she had to drop out of school. She never went past the third grade and really couldn't read or write. The fact is that apparently she could read and write quite well, even though she might have been sickly and might have had trouble concentrating. Because remember when we went to Andrews University, Nikki, and in the study library, in the James Wyatt Library, they have, it's a in their special study library that you can only go into with permission, they have a large a large wall covered with glass and wood bookcases Mm -hmm. that are under lock and key. And they are her private collection of books, hundreds of books on every subject imaginable, including the occult. Mm -hmm. So she was clearly reading, Yeah. but the myth inside is that she was sickly. So she did have apparently fits and faintings and, and Nikki talk about her relationship with her children. Oh, so uh, she actually said that even the letters that she writes are inspired by God, everything she writes. And as I was kind of looking at Adventism and trying to figure out, is this, is this right? Is it wrong? I found these letters she wrote to her son and she told her son, God does not love naughty children. Mm -hmm. And as I read that, and I, I worked my way through some of these other letters, I, I forget what she, she had a dream she wrote to him about of him in hell suffering which is interesting because they don't believe in hell right but she was very uh, manipulative very i i don't know i always think that if we could 
we would find a diagnosis for this woman. I think so too. Borderline narcissistic. Yeah. I'm not sure, but DID. she was she was highly controlling and manipulative, and used her visions to control not only these people who were establishing doctrines, but children, neighbors, mm -hmm. anyone of influence. So, I think she was a very nosy woman. She mm -hmm. has books that she wrote fleshing out people's secret sins that she sees in vision and calling them out on it and destroying them, publishing Putting them. them. In print. Mm -hmm. She was a very mean woman. Also, those children, those letters to her children <clears throat> were necessary because she traveled so much. And I find this to be interesting too, especially since she wrote child guidance and education and all these books on councils for teachers. But she herself would be gone weeks to even months at a time when her children were very young. And um, she would leave them in the care of people she knew, not necessarily relatives, I don't even know who, really, but they would be in her care and then she'd hear reports about them and then she'd write them these manipulative letters when she'd hear that they would be disobedient. Mm -hmm. And then and then you have this whole other aspect that's always so uncomfortable to talk about. And I, I guess I'd wanna give a warning here in case anyone's listening with their kids. Sure. Um, she would give strong advice to parents about what to do with their children. And she would suggest that they tie their hands to their beds and tie them up to prevent them from masturbating because that will cause mental illness, tuberculosis, uh, blindness, mm -hmm. a, a variety of things. She had a lot of guidance on the sexual relationship in a marriage. Uh, it, Women were not to undress in front of their husbands because it would excite animal passions which and and she believed in the vital force so you're only allowed so much energy in your lifetime and you have to spend it carefully and things like marital sex will deplete your vital force and you won't have as much energy to serve god okay so so, so in her, masturbation for children would do that too so wow. in her in her day-to-day -day, she was very preoccupied with controlling and and right. I, I wouldn't want to know her in her day-to-day -day. either and she was also deceptive you know the the health message and all of the advice that she left a strong legacy of non-meat eating and no um nothing like tea and coffee or stimulants you know and yet good people with you know who knew her well and traveled with her have written about later in her life how she would be on a trip and she would ask for oysters mm -hmm. or they find her eating her oysters behind a screen where nobody could see her um, she would write about having, you know, butchered a pig when she had already said pig shouldn't be eaten. So there was this duplicity about her. And um, I think also there was a lot of um, obsessive guilt and shame yeah. attached to that because she would write about agonizing over her problems. I mean, she wrote about her addiction to get this vinegar. And I want to say, wait a minute, that had to be wine, yeah. you know? Vinegar is the next step after wine, yeah. but she would talk about trying to give it up and having hallucinations if she gave it up. Now, I don't believe she's addicted to vinegar. That wow. sounds like alcohol. Yeah, so, I, yeah. just real quick, I have a question just that, that will complement what you're talking about right now. And Andrew, I'll let you jump in with questions that you have in just a moment. As soon as you're talking about you know, those graphic depictions as far as the rigid restrictions on sexual behavior, both with uh, children and also uh, with grown nuts between wives and husbands, my brain immediately uh, went to David Koresh. Oh, yes. He, uh, he, is direct, he was directly influenced, uh, and again, this is not about David Koresh, but I think we can just bring it up for a moment. The reason why I immediately thought of him, if anyone knows this whole story of Waco, is that in Mount Carmel, uh, even prior to the standoff in Waco, uh, David Koresh had implemented very uh, rigid restrictions uh, at the time of the raid, if I'm not mistaken, is that he had a policy that he was the only person in the compound mm -hmm. who was allowed to have sex. Uh, no one, even husbands and wives, couldn't, and he would use that. Right. Uh, what, just off really quickly, like, w what do you know about Koresh and sort of the influences that White would have had on him, because I know he did come from a branch of Seventh Day Adventism, but it was a spinoff. Right. Just real quickly yeah. before you go back to Ellen G. White. You know, I don't know a lot about him personally. Mm -hmm. um, he was a branch Davidian. Yes. And he, <laughs> he actually, I, I, I know personally um, a couple who had been the pastor and the pastor's wife of an Adventist church in Hawaii. 
that David Crush was a member of, and that was before he became David Crush. He was actually Vernon Howell or whatever mm -hmm. his name yeah, was. Vernon Howell was his name, correct? <clears throat> and when he was Vernon Howell, he was he wasn't completely okay mentally. Apparently, he was a little unstable in his personality, but he was very much devoted to Ellen White and her eschatological visions and predictions. And they had actually asked him, this couple that I knew, um, to leave that church because he was so disruptive. And it was after that that he formed his, mm -hmm. you know, his con his community up at right. Mount Carmel. And actually, I had a student at, in Idaho in the in the late seventies or early eighties who I learned later died in that fire at Waco. Wow. So it, it 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 yeah, he was he was an Adventist. Adventists want to distance themselves from that. He was a Branch Davidian, but Branch Davidians will tell you they are definitely related to Adventism and they and they honor Ellen. They follow Ellen White. So he was related to that and he didn't practice his whole thing with he was the only one who could have sex with the women in the convent. That is not in the in the community. That was not an Adventist teaching. Mm -hmm. That was his own perversion of everything. But yeah. he was related to Adventism and right. he did follow Ellen White. And I believe this is actually true. I've heard it from several places that there was a an Adventist PR director who helped the government understand how to get rid of him at Waco. Wow. Because they knew how he thought. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, yeah, so just I uh, appreciate you sharing that. I just thought of that immediately. Uh, just jumping back to Ellen G. White, Andrew, uh, what, what what thoughts and questions do you have right now? What's on your mind? Yeah, so I was wondering, <clears throat> as the uh, Seventh-day Adventism, I believe it started in March of 1863, uh, let's say even like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a little officially, exactly, like even a little bit before then and after it's official, what was her role? You said she traveled, right? Did she travel as this like apostle? Or something like was she the end all be all of these general conferences when they'd have doctrinal disagreements like what what did she do exactly it was her visions and yes um in the beginning she was james's traveling companion and prior to the organization of the of the denomin of the i don't want to call it a denomination prior to its organization she um provided the inspiration that gave james credibility during the millerite movement and just after the millerite movement so he would use her visions as a way of controlling the people that he was trying to coalesce into an organization because he could control he if he could control a church and have access to their tithe which was a mandate you know he could make money if he could if he could publish her visions which he did he could make money it was a money making thing in fact um, Dudley Kenwright, who had who was a contemporary of the Whites and actually worked with them and lived in their home as a young man, he actually ultimately left Seventh Day Adventism. But he writes about them and he says that when she died in 1915, the year she died, she she earned a hundred thousand dollars in royalties from her books. Now that was 1915, so she was um, she was the prophet, and as the prophet or the messenger she had the authority from god so she gave authority to the adventist doctrines and after the denomination or after the organization formulated itself officially um she continued to have those testimonies and visions yeah. and guided them so she was the source of god's will for them when you um when you i appreciate that when you look at a different cult uh, for example uh, joseph smith mormonism early 1800s mormonism both with Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, there was always chaos, specifically with Joseph Smith, wherever he went. There was always batting back and forth with the state. Uh, Joseph Smith, his death ended in a very violent way towards people radically opposed to him. Uh, with Ellen G. White, I mean, her controversies seem to be more internally within people following her, maybe having doubts, being jaded by these end times visions that didn't come to fruition. What was she, was there any sort of controversy, great controversy outside of her uh, apocalyptic visions just with uh, society, with the state, anything similar to early Mormon history? Would you, was she kind of a person to kind of go along to get along? What was that like? It's a good question, actually. Unlike Joseph Smith, she didn't have political controversy with the state that I am aware of. 
what she did have was a lot of internal controversy. And she, um, she had, within Adventism, there was controversy between her and, for example, John Harvey Kellogg, who began as an Adventist, began working for the whites, and they considered him like a protege, a brilliant young doctor, who eventually built a Battle Creek Sanitarium and the health reconditioning center that he made famous. And um, he ultimately was pushed out of Adventism because of theological disagreements with Ellen White, which actually people who have studied that believe there was probably theology was the cover story for the fact that he was a financial threat to her. She wanted control of that Battle Creek Sanitarium. And he said, no, I've founded this. So mm. they parted ways, you know, based on theological things over the Trinity, how ironic that these people who didn't believe in the classic Christian Trinity were arguing over the Trinity. Mm. But there were other men too. In fact, on, in our proclamation um, emails, we've just been sending out the chapters of the book Cast Out for the Cross of Christ by Albion Ballinger. Now he wrote and lived, his father was a founding Adventist and he grew up in Adventism and knew Ellen White as a young man when she was an old woman. But he grew up and she had a vision finally that he had to leave Adventism or else go to England and get out of the way of the General Conference because he didn't believe in her visions. And so she would destroy people through her visions, through her testimonies, if they didn't agree with her or if they threatened her or if they threatened her financially. She, her grip was very tight and there was a lot of internal conflict, but it wasn't with the state. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that it really wasn't with her, but but the overall feeling of Seventh-day Adventists throughout, I think, the entire history of the organization is to fear the government. Right. Because the government is what's going to come ultimately in the last days during Jacob's time of trouble. It, it's really yeah. that the church and the government are going to turn on Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. And we yeah. are going to have to flee and run to the hills and they are going to be given legal permission to come and kill us because we keep the Sabbath. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. And so we're raised with this and we believe this is true. And so you do everything you can to keep peace and make nice with mm -hmm. the government. And this is why they're very committed to, um, they've got a lot of, of representation in DC to, right. to maintain the separation of church and state uh, because they really don't want to see these laws pass that they're promoting these Sunday laws that are going to get people killed. And remember, they, they're they always throughout their history thinking that Jesus is going to come in my lifetime. So every Adventist that ever lived is waiting for the laws to turn against them. Mm -hmm. You can imagine the, the, the talk of Sunday laws that has burgeoned in the last two years. Yeah. So so what what was like a, the COVID in 2020 like within the SDA world? Like all of a sudden there's churches where some, some are closing down and stuff like that. What, what was going on? Hard to speak from the inside now. It is. Isn't that great? <laughs> but I can tell you this. During 2020, we started our former Adventist podcast in October of 2019. When COVID hit in March of 2020, the lockdowns, we started getting emails from people who said, I haven't been going to church and I finally had time to look around and ask some questions. We've had so many people who found our podcast and have been writing to us and have actually left Adventism because they've started to study their own questions. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I don't know about the church, about I, it. I don't either. We, it's nice to know what the Lord's doing instead, yeah, isn't it? It is. But I will say that in Adventism, anything that happens, whether it's a tsunami, a hurricane, <laughs> a political upset, anything is the last great event before something's going to happen. I remember in, yeah. on September 11, uh, when the towers fell, there was a lot of talk because oh, yeah. in Ellen White's books, is it Testimonies to the Church? Could be. I think she had volume nine, page 11, oh, right. yeah. she mm -hmm. tells a vision of two buildings falling to the ground. And mm -hmm. so everybody thought, Prophecy. everybody thought this is it. Yeah. This is it. Sunday law is coming. And the uh, Sunday law, you know, that means mark of the beast. If mm -hmm. you go to church on Sunday, that means you get the mark of the beast. That is the sign of the mark of the beast. And that is that Ellen G. White's teachings? Or is that yes, something yes. that's an involvement oh, later no, no, on? No. That's a part of Original. the great controversy yes. worldview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sabbath keeping, Seventh-day Sabbath, 
is the seal of God. Mm. Going to church on Sunday is the mark of the beast. Yeah. Come out of her, my people. Leave Babylon. That means come out of all of apostate Protestantism, mm. which has taken on the Catholic mark of the beast. Yeah. And you get back to the true church. Nikki, how long were you in the Seventh-day Adventist Church for again? 30 years. 30 years. Yeah, I was I was born into it on my mom's side, fifth generation. Okay. They went all the way back to Ellen in Maine. Okay. Um, I'm yeah. assuming we're roughly the same age. We're roughly probably around the same age. Uh, what what were like major events that you lived through as a Seventh-day Adventist world events? You mentioned 9-11. You think of like mm -hmm. Y2K when everyone thought that all the every, all everything was going to shut off. They're, you know, on the verge of the year 2000, there's all these like millennial cults and just a lot of uncertainty with the year 2000. Like, what were some events that you lived through as a Seventh Day Adventist? Like, people, world events that people know. Um, you know, I lived on the East Coast during Hurricane Hugo. I don't know if you remember that. And I remember thinking this was it because the tornado was went that a through hurricane my in town. Florida? It was in Florida, but I was in New England, and it spun off tornadoes. And so we had a tornado come through our town and the, mm. that happens really quickly. I don't know if you've been in a tornado, but you can have blue skies and all of a sudden, you you know, you've got this storm swirling around you. And I thought, here we go. <laughs> I live in Arizona. So the only thing we've had are the dust storms. Uh, okay. Where you have to pull to the side of the, of the freeway for a little bit. And then yeah, yeah. we're good. I've only seen the movie Twister. That's as much as I know about tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the only one I ever went through. Because uh -huh. um, I, I think I've spent most of my life in California. I bounce back and forth. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, it's hard to think of a lot of of the political things that went on. You know, we had the the war in Iraq and just about mm -hmm. anything, though, could set it off and get people wondering, you know, you yeah. hear about laws that are going to be passed. Um, that Sunday law has been floating around D.C. forever. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I don't oh know if it really life. has been, but even anything that the Pope does. Oh, yeah. Or if an important person goes to visit the Pope. Um <laughs> Just about anything can set that off. Yeah. Well, just because the reason why, yeah, because just the reason why I ask is that if you look at like the Awake magazine from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, they'll usually will be articulating a current event or they'll have these, this imagery of like stuff, uh, meteorites falling from the sky and oh, buildings yeah. falling down and people running away looking horrified. And they'll view current, <laughs> and, yeah, they'll view current events in that light. I think would be mm -hmm. good. Maybe the both of you can tag team together, because again, you're this whole movement organization to from today to its origins has always been these uh, syncretistic apocalyptic visions that also affect soteriology, Christology, mm -hmm. all those things. I'm just wondering, maybe you could take us inside the mind of somebody who is a Seventh Day Adventist. How do they view current events through the lens of the end times when an event like September 11th happens or even like 2020 with all the uncertainty, you know, how do they view that and how does that affect their worldview? And you probably, there's probably still ways in which you probably still think that way today. I'm not sure I, I do. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm there blind could be, to I don't it, know. but maybe, I maybe there's some who, maybe so there's some who do, you know, some, some people might, who are, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some, yeah, definitely yeah. what I mean is some ex-cult members will have sort of this, you know, it might be like a PTSD where all yeah, of a sudden sure. like immediately like it, something triggers them and there may have been people that you minister to where all mm -hmm, of a sudden something sure. happens and they see an event or they see something to do with that. Maybe this is end times and mm -hmm. immediately go back into how you're grown up and indoctrinated. You know, related to that, we are, like Nikki said, we're all taught that Christians are going to come and hunt and kill us as Adventists in the time of trouble because we refuse to, to honor Sunday. So we're going to be running to the hills and hiding in caves and trying to escape. And that the Sunday law will come in two phases. First, it will be national here in the United States and then mm. international. And it will be legal for people to take their guns and hunt and kill. When we left um, Adventism in 1998-9, uh, Richard's parents, well, uh, back up, they were very conservative historic Adventists who remained that way until they died but very bright. I mean, they were not like, I refuse to look, I don't want to know. They would argue with him. They, they knew why they believed what they believed, his mother especially, chapter and verse for everything she believed. And when we left, she said to him one night in dead seriousness, are you going to kill me now? Mm -hmm. Because Ellen said those who leave will be the worst persecutors. Those who once kept the Sabbath and don't no longer do will be the worst persecutors. Will you kill me now? Mm -hmm. So 
um, that's common. In fact, that camp. At us, yeah, at that's what table. I was thinking about. So they they prepare people from a very young age for this Sunday law that's going to come. They have something called Pathfinders. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's kind of mm -hmm. like a Girl Scout, Boy Scout kind of thing. Yeah. And, oh, Ed, by the way. And they yeah. teach these kids what they can eat in the woods. They mm -hmm. take them out there and they teach them what edible plants are and how to survive when it's time to run. Well, there's a camp called Camp Asal. I'll sobble, I can never say it correctly. I, I can't either, but it's in Michigan. In Michigan. <laughs> yeah. And a few years back, they had a Sabbath afternoon activity where the kids broke off into different groups and the adults and the camp counselors were play actors. They were soldiers, they had guns. And the kids had to run through the woods and try to stay away from these soldiers. And if they got captured, they had to determine if they were going to die for the Sabbath or not. And there was a photographer there named Alan Ho, I think. Mm -hmm. And he photographed this and there are images of children on their knees in the field with their hands over their head and adults pointing guns at them at yeah. their heads. And, and, and so this kind of thing goes on all over the place. There are people who, when these pictures came out in a lot of our former Adventist forums and on Facebook chat groups would talk about, oh, when I was a kid, they had so, uh, soldiers storm our church on a Sabbath morning right. and we didn't know it was fake and we were terrified. And so there's a lot of traumatizing that goes on. Yeah. Uh, there was required reading for your generation. You want the to tell them about now, that book? Uh, published by actually a 17 year old girl named Mary Kay Silver, who it was a, an assignment for her Bible class. And she wrote a, a story Mm -hmm. fictional story of fleeing during the time of trouble and being accosted with people with guns and the parents yeah. didn't go with her and i mean it was a terrifying book we all <laughs> and my husband richard says that in his bible class they were given an assignment to write yeah. a similar thing using mary Kay as a model wow is this so this kind of Oh, so this interpretation of, of of thinking that christians are going to go after them because of their view of the sabbath um, cause you're saying flee to the mountains in the all of it discourse. I mean, Christian, yeah. I mean, people, depending on your view of eschatology, you'll have different variations of the timing and what Jesus meant by that. But specifically the passage when Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee to the mountains, is, is that the passage that they kind of pull from to derive that sort of eschatological yeah, interpretation? I saw I was taught that. Yeah. And, and it was also a support for the Sabbath because Jesus says, pray that right. it's not in the winter mm -hmm. or on the Sabbath. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, and it, and when I left Adventism and started reading the Bible and believing the words, it became clear that I would have to flee to the mountains of Judea, right? <laughs> it, mm -hmm. it didn't work for everybody everywhere yeah. in no. all time. No, and and that I I also understood that passage to mean when that Sunday law is passed, that's when you flee. Mm. Okay. So you had asked how different events can trigger this. It's anything that goes on has everybody wanting to be five steps ahead of the Sunday law. Yeah. So they may not actually be talking about a Sunday law, but when the towers fell, or I had a sibling when bird flu came, she was getting ready to sell her tent trailer and decided bird flu is here, so we have plagues. I'm gonna keep that in case we have to run to the hills. It informs everything about mm -hmm. that traumatizing yeah. early yeah. on. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Andrew, so, what, what, what questions do you have? Yeah, so is there a, a need by people that are uh, Seventh-day Adventists to want to be included in the mainstream Christian church? Because it sounds to me like they they wouldn't want to, right? Because if it's the mainstream That's Christian church question. that is going to kill them, hunt them down with the government, why is there this weird blurring of distinctions that is going on? Why is there this weird... Uh, Christian language that is being used to make them seem like they are Christian, you know, like, why That's is that? Such a good question. You know, um, the way it looks to me, I think that a lot of this began literally, and I know we'll talk about this more later, but that it literally began back in the fifties with Walter Martin. And, um, there really has been within Adventism, some, who are more educated and who know the biblical languages and who have said, wait a minute, these Ellen White things. And you know, this has actually been true all through Adventism, even before Ellen White died. People who said, wait a minute, these visions don't quite line up with scripture. The Bible doesn't exactly say this is going to happen. So 
there are some Adventists who want to say, let's get rid of these embarrassing interpretations and let's frame ourselves as more Christian and we'll believe in Jesus and salvation by grace, but we'll keep that fourth commandment and we'll do the health message and we'll be better than everybody else because we're going to be so much healthier and live so much longer and we're going to have that Sabbath rest that everybody will envy. And then there are the others who go, no, <clears throat> Ellen White was the prophet. We have to go with her. We can't, we can't use her just the way we want to. We have to take her word to be. So there has always been this kind of push-pull. And geographically, wouldn't you say, Nikki, Adventism differs geographically around the world? And I'd add generationally. Absolutely. Because you had people like Desmond Ford who came out and exposed the issues with the investigative judgment. And you had, uh, you had people like <laughs> Venden mm -hmm. who would come out and teach. Uh, was, did he call it righteousness by righteousness faith? Righteousness by faith, yeah. Which he still isn't quite right. He didn't call it justification mm -hmm. by faith, but yeah. But so you had people who would start using Christian language to the younger generations. And we would hear, okay, it's all by faith. It's all... You know, but what about, and it, it was very crazy making, yeah. actually, it was less honest, but you had these ministers who were trying to integrate Ellen White, Seventh-day Adventism, and their concept of grace, which I think came out of their own dissonance, not out of good Bible teaching from right. Christian pastors. And they would, they'd syncretize all of this stuff up and you would have young people saying, oh, you know what? I don't believe Ellen White, but I, but I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I love my church. And then they don't know what, how much of what they believe comes from Alan, from the top to the bottom, from, from who God is, who man is, what the sin mm -hmm. problem is, what the answer is. They'll use Christian language because they're getting this mashup and they don't even know their need. And there we have the worldview. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that I have found over the last 20 some years that we've been doing this ministry with Life Assurance Ministries. We are located in Southern California where Adventism tends to be much more evangelical or progressive, you know, quite liberal. If you go back to Andrews where the seminary is, you'll find much more historic Adventism. And this all coexists. And even in our inland empire here, we have whole congregations that are very historic, very Ellen White centered, and others that are like, we'll just use her as an inspired writer and we're just going to partner with everybody in the community to do social, to meet social needs. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, there's a, an attraction to Christians because mm -hmm. Christians have joy that does yeah. not make sense to us. Does to, not to, make to, sense. It didn't make sense yeah. to me. me either. And I would go to Christian concerts and be a part of, um, interdenominational like women's conferences. I, I remember one time in particular, I left and was handed a Sunday law book by an Adventist call porter. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know I was an Adventist, but you're drawn to that. And you think you know what they're talking mm -hmm. about because it's been mm -hmm. redefined to you by these grace Adventist pastors. And I loved the music and, and I loved the Bible, but it was all so confusing right. to me. And when mm -hmm. I was saved, all of the sudden, all of these songs, all of these Christian songs, made sense in a way that they right. never did right. until what I the, understood the gospel. What were some of the Christian concerts you went to? Like any well-known artists oh. like DC Talk, Jars of Clay, Avalon, um, Point of Grace? Third, trying... day. Yeah, third Day. Third Day. I went to Third Day. I went to um, concerts to them. One time I day. went to Supertones. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I listened to Air One out here in Southern California. Oh, wow. So yeah. whatever was on the radio, I I, I can't yeah, recall I can all of them. Imagine. And then I, I went to some uh, women of faith conferences and mm. so they had like Natalie Grant come out and people like that. Yuck. So that was all influencing me. And then in our local church, we have a guy who he's a doctor and doctors usually have the most influence and power. And he mm -hmm. would bring in people like Chris Rice and I can't think of everybody. He Michael brought him, Card but yeah. And glad. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you really get the idea that we're just like you. We just have the sap. We just have more truth than you do. We're not going to say that to and you. And so come join but, us because you'll be happier with us. Yeah. But the worldview, the worldview is the same, whether you're a historic Adventist or a progressive one. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, to be really honest, I really think that was what Walter Martin failed to understand is in, you know, just talking, watching, rewatching those talks with William Johnson. Adventists have a physicalist worldview, and that is true across the board. They actively teach we do not have an immaterial spirit that is separate from the body. 
that affects Jesus. He doesn't have an immaterial spirit separate from the so body. So would that be a reform? Is that like us. reverse Gnosticism? Gnosticism yeah, then? I, that's what I often call it. I do. It's like the reverse of Gnosticism. It's, mm. a, it's a physicalness. So that even heaven is physical. Even Orion, you know, Jesus right. is going to come through Orion. There's a pyramid up in the middle of Orion somewhere. How would that affect their view uh, when it comes to uh, their diet, how they eat? a big portion of what they're known for. And I don't know if it's as a whole. I mean, as a whole, are they vegetarian? Is that is that an Ellen G. White's teaching? Or what is that? What did Ellen G. White teach when it came to diet? And how the, how would that relate to uh, spirituality from Ellen G. White's perspective? Oh, that's a super good question because it's everything. Yeah. Um, she said that she didn't say you can't go to heaven if you eat meat. But she said that nobody eating flush foods will be translated. And in Adventist speak, translated is be taken to heaven without dying first. Mm -hmm. But she did say you can't eat any of the unclean meats as defined by the Levitical food laws. Mm -hmm. So, Well, she also said not to expect God to answer your prayers if there's butter right. on your table. Butter or eggs. And don't expect your children to be able to, you know, you can't pray for your children if you're feeding them eggs and butter. Right. So there were there was there was the double speak. There was to be no uh, stimulants, which included cinnamon, anything, anything yeah. she knew about black pepper, coffee, tea, uh, chocolate. Um, mm -hmm. Well, not the, the, yeah. So like now just real quickly, and Andrew, I'll let you jump in too if you have questions. So Gnosticism, I mean, people even even in the in the New Age they have an underlying Gnostic worldview. So a lot of times when you look at ideas that they have when it comes to diet, they'll look yep. at things that are real in regards to uh, cleansing, like your, your body, like mm -hmm. clinic, like clearing out, uh, doing a cleanse or <clears throat> helping, you know, your gut or get, uh, having probiotics, but they'll view it through the worldview of aligning your chakras and they'll have pre-commitments right. through the lens of things that are real and nutritional, the world that God created mm -hmm. to help us. But it's done through that underlying worldview. What's interesting is that now if you look at Adventism from your perspective of a worldview where it's uh, – there's an emphasis where we're not immaterial spirits but we're just physical. Right. Like the – it seems to me that there's probably some sort of syncretistic aspect there within – there is uh, – yeah, within the, the – uh, my mind's running, drawing a blank here. But uh, within the food, within your, your health and overall well-being and how you eat – that affects who you are spiritually. Elaborate on that, uh, if you could. Well, here's the thing. Ellen taught, and they still actively teach this today. I have heard their current general conference president say this in a video that at, a, at a meeting in Switzerland. They teach that, because we don't have spirits, the Holy Spirit is perceived through the neurons of the frontal lobe. So in order to access the knowledge of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom from the Holy Spirit and the insight from the Holy Spirit, you have to be healthy. You have to eat right. You have to not eat food that is unclean, including the stimulants. You can't, you know, this will improve your spiritual perception. And it will also make it so that you can understand Adventism better. It's, co it's connected with, you know, educate your children in Adventist schools, give them the vegetarian diet so that they will expose themselves. Their minds will be built up to receive the Holy Spirit's information. And mm -hmm. this is the only way to do it. And this is related to being saved. You can't be saved if you don't have the knowledge. It's not being born again. It's having the knowledge so that you can believe the right things. And I have to say, this is all related. I'm sorry, I just bumped That's my right. mic. This is all related to Ellen White's belief that the gospel is cognitively, not spiritually, perceived. So, for example, when she was writing, these are things that they don't talk about very much anymore, but they're still in print. She said, back in the, before the Civil War, that slaves, you know, those poor slaves would not be saved because they didn't have the mental capacity to understand the gospel. So God would mercifully make it so as if they had never existed when they died. They would just, they would not be punished. They would just go completely out of existence wow. because they lacked the mental capability of understanding the gospel. So when I was growing up, and I think this is still true, um, if a person is born developmentally disabled, for example, it was common knowledge that those people could not be saved because they didn't have the mental capacity to be saved. 
They couldn't be mentally healthy. It was a shock to me and to my husband when we first joined a Christian church and they actually had a ministry for adult developmentally disabled people. And those people couldn't even always talk, but they were in church on Sunday, singing, worshiping, praising, and they loved Jesus. And it was clear they loved Jesus. They knew him Mm -hmm. and they didn't have the mental capacity to know him, but Uh they knew him. That was amazing for me. Mm -hmm. Andrew, what what questions do you have? What's in your mind? Yeah. Can you clarify something for me? Because I'm just a little confused myself. So they're pure. They believe in things that are purely physical. You said the Holy Spirit perceived through the frontal lobe is the Holy Spirit a spirit is the father That's a good question. spirit. Um, because if there's, if it's purely physical and it sounds to me like as well, that uh, the gospel itself or all of this knowledge, it sounds like is innate within us in our physical yes. brain. It just needs to yeah. be unlocked somehow by you, the way you eat uh, the things that you're taught uh, in order to give you this, uh, I guess the word I, you know, in a way would be like a mental salvation or like an, uh, an ascension in a way from like the normal person is, is God's spirit like the scriptures Good say, question. um, That's and how a- can you have one or the other, especially if heaven is some actual physical location? Well, yeah. Yeah. And here's the deal from the beginning. They believed God, the father was not spirit. James White wrote a, a pamphlet in 1861 and notice that's two years before the official organization. So it was a well-formed group. It just hadn't, you know, made a corporation of itself yet. He wrote a pamphlet called The Personality of God, in which he argued that God, in fact, this is a quote from it, the sectarian, meaning those Sunday, those sects of Christians that call themselves Christians, the sectarian has a God without body or parts. Who can define the difference? For our part, we do not perceive a difference of a single hair. They both claim to be the negative of all things which exist. He says, um, God is material, organized intelligence, possessing both body and parts. Man is in his image. I was taught that being created in God's image was involved how I looked, having eyes, nose, mouth, hands. And Ellen White was not as clear as James, but she wrote that she saw the lovely Jesus when she was taken to heaven, and she asked him, does your father have a body like you? And he said, you cannot see my father because there is this, you know, this glory around him, but he has a form just as I do. Mm -hmm. Did you understand that too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we all thought God had a body. For sure. And, And the Holy Spirit, that's an interesting question. I never really knew what to do about that. Um... I thought of the Holy Spirit as a spirit, Mm -hmm. but I didn't understand the simplicity of God. Mm -hmm. I did not understand that. And so um, I think, I think, and this is kind of embarrassing to admit, I thought of it kind of like God, the father, the Holy Spirit being more of a feminine side of God Mm -hmm. and then Jesus, the son. And um, right. In fact, the original Adventists, including James White, including, by the way, J.N. Andrews, for whom their flagship seminary is named, died a staunch anti-Trinitarian, just by the way. Mm-hmm. So they they taught that the spirit was like a force emanating from God yeah. and from Jesus. Some of them would say from Jesus. Yeah. They taught that Jesus had some sort of a beginning back before the beginning of time, but did not possess after becoming incarnate, did not possess omnipresence, which Mm -hmm. of course means you lose an attribute of God, right? And that is not God. Sorry for interrupting your currently scheduled programming, but did you know you can go to apologiastudios.com and become an all access member? With all access membership, you get exclusive content from all of Apologia Studios productions. Not to mention Cultish is an Apologia Studios production. So you'll get access to Cultish, the aftermath where Jerry and I talk together after our most recent series discussing what we thought. It's really cool. We have a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, we can't do this without the studio. It keeps the lights on. And we can't also do this without you. So please go to ApologiaStudios.com and become an all access member. 
Hey, what's up, everyone? We love that you are enjoying our content on a weekly basis, but this program cannot continue and wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you want to go to thecultistshow.com, there is a donate tab. You can either support us one time or you can become a monthly partner with us that will allow us to continue this program, allow us to continue to be salt and light to the kingdom of the cults. So please go to thecultistshow.com forward slash donate and you can support us one time or monthly. Also, make sure you check out our merchandise store. Go to shopcultish.com. You can see all of our great designs. A lot of you have gotten merchandise from us already. So again, you either go to shopcultish.com and check out all the awesome merch. Back to the show. When you come, when it comes to Christology, maybe this would be good because we one of the things that Walter Martin said, which I always appreciate so much, he says, I urge you not to become an expert on the cults. Become an expert on who the person of Jesus Christ is, and you'll never be fooled by anyone. It's the people who are uninformed who get sucked into the cults. Uh, so Christology 101, Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. God come in the flesh, the Logos, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, what the Word was with, with God, and the Word was God, John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Given, given the nature, the general nature of Christology, of what Christians historically have believed through all Christian creeds, how do how do Seventh Day Adventism view that? Do they believe that Jesus preexisted prior to the incarnation? You have other groups that who are modalists in nature, like the UPCI, who are who deny the Trinity as well too. Um, like, how do they view Christ? Like when, like for example, going forward from the Logos to when Christ uh, gave up the Spirit after he was when he was crucified. Like, what happened there? I mean, Gnosticism have have their own views as well too. Given that it sounds like you're saying is the reverse of it. How do they view Christology? Well, they have really done a great job of cleaning up their language because they know it's a problem. So publicly, their fundamental belief on Christ, if you just read the fundamental belief, you might go, "Mm, it's not a strong statement, but it's believable. But here's the, the actual fact. Ellen White late into the 1900s, long after James died, after her great controversy book was written, she was still writing that God was the heavenly trio or the three worthies of heaven who condescend to help us if we need his help to overcome sin. Mm -hmm. So the three worthies, the heavenly trio. In 2006, and I think this is so important, it's just when I discovered this, it was like shocking to me, There is a professor who I believe is still there at Andrews University named Jerry Moon. And he wrote a document on the heavenly trio compared with the classic Christian Trinity. And he very accurately explains that there's a difference. The heavenly trio of Ellen White is not the same as the classic Christian Trinity. They do not believe that the persons of the Trinity share substance. They Adventists will not affirm shared substance. But he concludes his document by saying it is the heavenly trio that is the true biblical trinity, not the classic Christian trinity. Mm -hmm. So Adventists in general don't even know. It was, my goodness, I want to say five, six years after we left Adventism before I really started to understand that I'd been taught something really wrong about the trinity. Mm -hmm. Because I was taught Jesus was all God. The Holy Spirit's all God. But to say it. They say it. Yeah. But to me, that was like, if I have a third of a pie and I take a third of the pie, that's Jesus. That's all pie. Mm. You know, I didn't know that it meant if there's a little seed and a little piece of brown sugar and a little peck of peel in that pie, all of the Trinity has to have those attributes, all the same ones. I didn't understand that. That changed everything for me. And and as far as Christology goes, we're told that Jesus was Michael the Archangel. Right. And so he was an angel up there and he got elevated, promoted, I I guess is how I would describe it, up to sonship. And so, and you know, there continues to be a big discussion about the nature of Christ. That's true. My father-in-law believes he's Arian. He doesn't believe that Jesus is God. And he's an Adventist pastor. Yeah, he's... He was well, let go, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> self-styled. So, um, so then there's this also this very typical argument in a Saturday morning Sabbath school class. Could Jesus have sinned? Yeah. Was Jesus, did he have a fallen nature? Because everything's physical. 
And so you have him, yes, he took a body, but, but the big question for them isn't what was he beforehand? Cause they figured that out. That's Michael, the archangel. What he was after he took his body is the big discussion. Yeah. Did he have a fallen nature? Could he have sinned? And the, the book that we showed you that in the last discussion we had, the fundamental beliefs book, when they get to the nature of Christ, they actually say that it wouldn't have been fair if Jesus couldn't have sinned. That's a ridiculous right. thought. Of course he could sin. Mm -hmm. That's what made him our savior. He right. could have, but he didn't. I was taught that. I remember being taught he couldn't be our savior unless he wow. could sin. It takes away the impeccability of God. Yes. But um, quick question. So what in the world is even an angel? Are they UFOs? Like, <laughs> oh, well, you know, you know they, they actually address that in this book. Um, they say, for example, um, you know, an angel can appear. They can appear in a body. I mean, it's not like they, they are always invisible. And, um, you know, what if God can appear as, as, a, as having a body? So they actually speculate but they use the appearances in the old testament of the angel of the lord and the various you know angelic appearances like that and say well you know there's body there somewhere i think i believed that they were spirits as an adventist personally i can't tell you where i got that idea from but i also believe that every single person had an assigned angel that was walking with them through life and so there's a lot of prayer in adventism for god to bring angels to us mm -hmm. to protect us with angels there's a lot of angel stories in adventism and and if you get to the root of ellen white and the the things that she says i really think there's a lot of angel worship in adventism i agree and not at the at the level where you're going to talk to an adventist and they're going to tell you they worship angels but there's mm -hmm. an elevation a glorifying of angels in yes. that organization yeah here here's a quick quote that i think will be informative from this book in their chapter the nature of humanity yeah um could could it be that a spiritual being may have a <clears throat> spiritual body with a form and features these passages seem to indicate that god is a personal being and has a personal form this should come as no surprise for man is created in the image of god now again that's not in the actual public fundamental belief that's in the book that explains to the members how to understand the fundamental belief Mm. Okay. What about um, Ellen G. White? I mean, just making a quick uh, deterrent to uh, Joseph Smith, uh, James White, uh, not not Ellen G. White's husband, but our elder James White. Oh, You're right. probably familiar with him. Uh, mm -hmm. He <laughs> made a statement on one of the sermons at Apology at Church that he was talking specifically about Joseph Smith. He said that if Joseph Smith had lived and didn't die at Carthage jail, Mormonism, in his opinion, wouldn't have existed because Smith's beliefs were evolving so quickly. It just, it wouldn't be, it would, would have basically canceled itself out. When it comes to Ellen G. White throughout her uh, linear timeline and her involvement of her theology, and it's all based off these syncretistic end times apocalyptic revelations, was there any involvement of her theology? Were, were there any current revelations that contradicted previous revelations? Because with oh, Joseph, yeah. like in the Book of Mormon, for example, you'll see examples where there's passages that are very Trinitarian. But then as you look at additional scriptures like the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price and even his own teachings, that's where you start to see the plurality of gods or the idea of God having a body of flesh and bones. What did that look like with Ellen G. White? Well, she she did evolve and they are very fond of saying she uh she had progressive revelation that the things that she said at the beginning she corrected as she got older and um understood by the bible better but the fact is there's two things that i want to say about that the fa the facts are that in the beginning she was um highly influenced by the anti-trinitarian overt anti-trinitarian teachings of J of james um, as time went on, they had Christian input and they realized that they couldn't necessarily present themselves as just a part of the Christian community if they didn't get better doctrines. What concurrently went on was Ellen White began to plagiarize and they've proven that she plagiarized. She plagiarized 
like 80% of her famous book on the life of Christ, The Desire of Ages, which people say is just such an amazingly beautiful book. Now, the fact is, if you really read The Desire of Ages, she's not orthodox, but she has a lot of orthodox sounding phrases. Um, Walter Ray in 1982, this was published, it was, he was promised by the Adventist organization that this would be publicized to the church after he turned in his research. He did a word for word comparison because he loved Ellen White. He was an Adventist minister who memorized her. And one day in a used bookstore, he came across a book and he's reading it and he's thinking, I memorized these words out of the Desire of Ages. And he took the book home. I think it was Edersheim's Life of Paul. And mm -hmm. he took it home and he began to realize that she did copy often word for word, often idea for idea, phrase for phrase from that book. And he published his research. He presented it to the church leaders and they said they would, they gave him a time frame. It was, it seems like it was a period of months or years. And they, they would then announce this fact of her having plagiarized, which was not acknowledged by her to the church and they didn't do it. So you know what he did? He, he gave the information to the Los Angeles Times and they broke the story. It was a huge scandal. Yeah. But the fact is, then the Adventists hired their own internal investigator who said, yes, yes, there is, um, there is plagiarized material here. They found also that her great book, The Great Controversy, was plagiarized a lot, some of it from her own husband. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, her ideas didn't all come from her visions. She claimed her visions, but right. she did copy work from true Christian writers. And mm -hmm. that made the whole matter more confusing. But then we get past those books where she did all that copying into the late, later part of her life, like 1904, 1905, 1908 and seven, where she's still writing about the heavenly trio and the three worthies of heaven. Yeah. And she's, and she's still denying the absolute impeccability of Christ and his full sharing of substance with the Father and the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, no, she didn't change. She just, her words changed. But, mm -hmm. you know, the fact is that woman was not born again. She didn't right. believe she had a spirit. She didn't understand born dead. She didn't believe in original sin. And Adventists are taught not to believe in original sin. That's a Catholic doctrine. So, you know, the fact is, doesn't matter what she wrote in practice, Adventists are still taught the same things. Yeah. No, that that's that's interesting. Um, so, 2020, you mentioned you started the podcast around then. We all know 2020 was a very, very interesting year. It was very cultish, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you think about it. Um, one thing that was really emphasized was the politicians who are who are practicing rules for thee, but not for me. Mm -hmm. Right? You think about Gavin, like in your in your uh, in your state, Gavin Newsom. I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> he would make all these insane restrictions there. Like I went one time to Oakland, California for work and it was insane. Like I had to get my temperature checked. I mean, it seemed like the people were cooking Thai food for us, but they were acting like they were in an ER as far as san uh -huh. sanitation goes. It was wild <laughs> and crazy. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, there are these crazy restrictions, but Gavin Newsom got busted because he was pictured with a bunch of people all together, like without a mask. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how you feel about the whole situation, what you should and shouldn't do, everyone knew he was telling everyone to do one thing, but he wasn't doing it himself. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Ellen G. White and how she interacted, how she dictated things, I'm setting you up for this, Did you? Is, are there any parallels? Was there parallels in her ministry when it came and how she conduct herself when it came to how you should eat, uh, what you should and shouldn't do? What would be some examples if there are some of rules for thee, but not for me? Well, the oysters is one that comes to my mind. And, and it, it's like, like with Gavin Newsom, it's a matter of being caught. So yeah. it, it wasn't like she could publicly do whatever she wanted and then tell everyone else what to do. She, she was right. It was secret. It was secret with the exception of the vinegar issue. Well, that was even a little secret. <laughs> you know, she did write about it eventually, but. Yeah. But even even leaving her kids for the long periods of time that she did, yeah. her advice to families and, and child guidance wouldn't permit something like that no. for anybody else. Mm -mm. Um, so, yeah, so the, the food she ate, the way she raised her family, the way she was with her husband. Yes. You know, um, 
this isn't exactly the same, but it's an interesting little episode. And Dudley Kenwright, again, the contemporary of that lived with them and wrote about his interactions and work with them. He writes about um, being a young married man himself. And this was, I, you know, I want to say, I don't remember the years. It was, I don't remember the years this happened, but Ellen White came up with this idea of reform dress. And it was very popular in a lot of the health conditioning uh, institutions at the time. And reform dress consisted of a shorter dress, like, you know, maybe mid calf, but then with bloomers that went down to the ankles. So it was like a little looser, a little less draggy in the muddy, so that it was a little more practical, but it was so unstylish. And it was, it was, it was like only the extreme fanatics would wear it, but she liked it. And mm -hmm. she made a mandate that all Adventist women had to wear reform dress, but not just reform dress, it had to be the pattern that she made available. So through the official church paper, the Adventist Review, she had a pattern that they could buy for $1. And, you know, I believe this was before the turn of the century, be before 1900. That yeah. was a, an exorbitant price for a pattern back mm. then. Okay. And so... So Dudley Kenwright writes about his wife dutifully wearing these things and the boys along the street throwing things at her and teasing her and shouting cat call, you know, really being rude to her in public because it was so funny looking. Mm -hmm. And then Mrs. White just up and moved to California and she quit wearing this thing and she didn't say anything. She just quit wearing it. So people who noticed her thought, well, I guess that's over. And gradually it filtered back to the East and was never heard of again. Yeah. Uh, and I have just another question quick, uh, real quickly, and then Andrew, I'll let you uh, take the next question. Uh, so going to, uh, we kind of have an idea of Ellen G. White, the impact that she made throughout uh, her lifetime and how, how she evolved from uh, the Millerites now to having her own uh, organization, really seeing as, seeing as a head person. Most of the time when you look at different uh, cults uh, or just cultish movements, when the leader dies, there's usually a fragmentation and severance. Mm -hmm. There's the question about who's going to be the successor. You had a lot of controversy in Scientology between L. Ron Hubbard, David Miscavige. You think about the severance between uh, after Joseph Smith died uh, between the FLDS uh, and also not the FLDS, but the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, yeah. which is the Mormon Church. How did that affect there? What you said there wasn't a successor to Ellen G. White. Um, what happened after when she passed away? How did she pass away? And then how did what happened right after the church? How did they evolve and handle her passing from your perspective? Well, I, I think she died of quotes natural causes. Um, she was it was 1915. There's an interesting story about her burial. Nobody can exactly explain it, but they waited 30 days to bury her, and it appears that it was because she had said things that that indicated she would be alive when Jesus came. So the, the whole group is like expecting she's going to be resurrected. And they finally couldn't hang on to the body any longer. And there was never a good explanation. So, um, but what was really interesting was that four years later in 1919, the man who was the general conference president then hosted a what they called a Bible conference. And one of the primary discussions at that Bible conference was, do we uphold Ellen White's visions? The, the leaders were not all in agreement about her. In fact, there was a lot of disagreement. But by then, they had a really rather well-organized uh, system going. They had conference presidents. They had organizations. They had, they had officers. They had a tithing system. They were developing schools by then. And um, to, to discredit her visions would shatter this organization that they were already beginning to profit from. So in the 1919 Bible conference, even the president, Daniels, admitted that they had problems with her, with her reliability as a prophet, but they decided that it would be too hard to tell the brethren. It would be too disruptive to their faith. And they decided to just, you know, continue to uphold her and they sealed the records of that Bible conference, and they, they said they were not to be opened for 50 years. They were found in the very early 70s in a, like a paper package tied with string in back office in the general conference, 
and they've since been, you know, published online and we can read them now. Mm -hmm. But we learned that from the beginning, they had these questions, but by then they had an organization they were already profiting from. And you were going to say something about her successor. Well, I just found this book um, titled, Will There Be Another Special Messenger? You can find it on egwwritings.org. And Mm -hmm. in it, they talk about whether or not there's even a need for a successor or another messenger. And they explain that in Bible times, (laughs) the the prophets spoke orally and over time that would be forgotten. And and so God would need to bring up another prophet. And, but Ellen White has a lot of writings that she's given us and that's timeless. That's going to stick. We don't need new prophets coming up to remind us of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, so they have this, this discussion on, on whether or not, you know, what if somebody comes and says that they have, the gift of prophecy, you know, how do you test them? And they said that they have to agree fully, they have to pass the test of scripture, and they have to agree fully with everything Ellen White taught in, mm-hmm. the, in the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that, that's Andrew, what confuses Andrew, me, Andrew, like, like in, the, in the 28 articles, one of them is the gift of prophecy, and then it says you must test them according to the tests in scripture, but uh, Deuteronomy 18 clearly says if there's one false prophecy, then they're mm-hmm. not of right. God. So are they actually being faithful in that no. manner, right? No, it's double speak. It's, and that's why so many Adventists feel confused and cognitively dissonant. Yeah. Hmm. So, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And in fact, Ellen White has a statement. We were just talking about this this morning. Um, they put on the, on, on the ellengwhite.org site where you can find her writings online as the as the page is loading, this quote comes up where she says, my writings will speak. Um, I'm trying to pull it up uh, here. Yeah, we're trying to find it. Um, right here. Here it is. Abundant light has been given to our people. Um, my writings will constantly speak and their work will go forward as long as time shall last. My writings are kept on file in the office. And even though I should not live, these words that have been given to me by the Lord will still have life and will speak to the people. So she called her words living. Yeah. Nikki, I have a question for you. And sure. and also Colleen, I'll let you about, uh, I think you. Should, I want to have you answer the question too after Nikki. You mean growing up in Adventism for 30 years, most people, you grow up kind of even hearing like from your childhood stories about Ellen G. White and really looking to her in a reverential state. Like I, I had classmates, for example, who were LDS who had books like child books about the Mormon pioneers and talking about Joseph Smith and understanding that. How did you view Ellen White growing up? And then as you left, started having doubts about Seventh-day Adventism and left, What were some of the challenges and how did you shift in regards to how you viewed her versus how you view her now? Like linearly for you personally, what did that look like for you? Well, as a child growing up, I just believed she was our prophet and that she had truth and that God chose her to lead us through the last days. So I just believed it. Middle school, I started asking questions. I think a lot of teenagers do, you know, how did I get so lucky to be born into the remnant church, the one true church? Uh, I don't have that kind of luck in life. So Mm -hmm. how did I fall on that luck here? And so I questioned it. And um, about that time, I ended up going to, Adventism has a lot of boarding academies for kids. And so I came out to California and went to a boarding academy for a while and experienced a different version of Adventism. And it had more of the grace talk involved. And, And then I wanted to know this God. And so then there was interest in him, but I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to know Ellen White. That was kind of for the older folks. And so that was sort of my rebellion, I guess, Mm -hmm. Uh, as a teenager. um, Had kind of a rough time uh, from about 16 to 19. And I would say that I wasn't I, I wasn't interested in Adventism at all. And I just pretty much felt like God didn't want me. And I so I had a stint just in the world. Yeah. And um at 19 I decided, all right, this isn't good. <laughs> I have to I have to do better and the only thing I knew was Adventism and I went back and I gave it my all. I met my husband and um we were both ordained elders 
at the Adventist organization in Southern California, they will ordain women. And mm -hmm. I didn't know I, we weren't biblical. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so we threw ourselves into that and it wasn't until I had my son that we started really trying to figure out what are we going to do? Because there's a lot here that we don't agree with. There's a lot of Adventism that doesn't stick that we just don't see as true, but are we going to raise our kids here? And then just tell them, well, we don't believe this. They teach it, but we just, you know, just kind of filter that out. At some point, we knew they were going to become teenagers and they were going to question everything we taught them. And the people that we allowed to influence them would have a greater voice than we would. Mm -hmm. And there were our people in the Adventist organization who are going after the youth and bringing them into these ministries, these call porter ministries, where instead of going to college, they go, I think it's in Arizona, there's yeah, one, they one there. and they teach them how to sell and pass out Adventist books and literature in various communities, and then they bus them all over the country, and, and they're out selling literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't want that kind of thing for our kids, and so we really felt like we needed to dig in and figure this out. And um, Long story short, I found Dale Ratzleff's book. My mother-in-law actually gave it to me. Um, Truth led me out, and it's his story of leaving as an Adventist pastor and coming to the gospel. And um, as my husband and I fleshed out our beliefs, I said to him, what if we are wrong? What if we're being deceived like they told us and Ellen White was right, and we're a part of the great shakening that's going to happen right before the Sunday law where people <laughs> fall away and apostatize. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, Ellen White said that, that everything she believed came from the Bible. So if we read the Bible and we only trust the Bible, then it's either going to prove Ellen White is a false prophet or it's going to lead us back to Ellen White. So we can't go wrong if we just read the Bible. And that was the end of Adventism for us. Wow. Colleen, what about you? I, I actually had an odd situation about Ellen White, and that was that my mother never fully believed in the investigative judgment. She had a, a brother who was an Adventist pastor who was actually a taken out of being a pastor in the 1950s because he refused to teach the investigative judgment. And so I grew up in a family that uh, was staunchly Adventist, believed all the stuff, except we weren't sure because it didn't make sense that God wouldn't know his own. So I grew up with this um, idea that she might be a prophet and in other things she could have been right. So I couldn't dismiss her in case she was right. So it was mm -hmm. a kind of a, a bifurcated thing in my head. But I was staunchly Adventist, went all the way through Adventist schools, Adventist college, uh, taught in an Adventist school. And in 1980, I got a hold of Desmond Ford's defense against the investigative judgment. And I read it, and I read it along with the book of Daniel, which I'd never read before. And I thought, okay, he's right. It's not here. But I think I can still believe in Ellen White. So fast forward to, um, to the early 90s, Richard and I uh, moved into the house where we live now, in, interestingly enough, and our, we noticed that our neighbors had a sign out that said Bible study every Wednesday night. So we thought, okay, they're Christians. Well, we were Adventists, but we were at this point cognitively dissonant Adventists, if you want to put it that way. So Richard invited them to a Bible study, and he, he believed we might be able to make them Adventists, and they'd probably be good Adventists. I, in my head, wasn't so sure that would happen. But we did decide we'd study with them. So, you know, that was the, that was the thing God used for us. They finally said yes. It took them four months to say yes. They knew we were Adventists. But they started coming over every Tuesday night, and we started doing something we had never done before. We started reading through books of the New Testament in context, one chapter a week, and talking about the chapters. And we started bumping into our proof texts, but they were in context, and they didn't say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And one night, um, we'd talk about what we thought passages meant, and one night, um, you know, after Mel said for the umpteenth time, well, where do you find that in the Bible? I looked at Richard and said, you suppose we ought to tell him? And he said, yeah. And Richard said, Adventists have a prophet. And the look on their faces, they had lived in this area all this time, but didn't know that. And so that was kind of like the beginning of the end. For three years, we met and did that Bible study. We went through almost the entire New Testament. We did the book of Daniel one chapter at a time. And I remember the night, the morning after one of our Bible studies, Richard looked at me and said, do you feel like you've become a Christian for the first time? I said, mm. yes. Yeah. It's like the gospel isn't what we were told it was. That was it. And then we just had to unpack some of the details about Ellen 
And that was the end. We knew we couldn't go back. And it was and it was our kids that made us finally leave. We stood in the kitchen one day and said, you know, we can't keep pretending. We can't go to Adventism and teach them truth and change them from the inside. They're not going to change because if we do that, we're professing not to believe Adventism, but we're acting like we are Adventists in the Adventist lies. And I and I remember we looked at each other and said, we can never expect our boys to tell us the truth if we do that and we have to leave. Yeah. Andrew, what a no! Thank you so much for sharing that, Andrew. What, what questions do you have? What are your thoughts? Uh, right now, I'm just speechless. I think that's amazing. I love the fact that both of you sisters have pointed out that the Bible is enough. Mm-hmm. The Bible is and was enough. Like that's God's word. That's what we have uh, to train us in righteousness. To know for certain that Jesus was the Christ and that He is coming again, but according to His standard, not Ellen's <laughs> standard. Not anyone else's standard, but according to the word of God. And anyone who claims to be a mouthpiece for God or speak for God, we have the ability through God's word to cross-check them to Scripture. Just like Paul tells the Bereans that they're more noble than those in Thessalonica, than those in Thessalonica, and that when he went and preached to them the gospel, they cross-checked him with Scripture to see with what he was saying was so. And guess what? It was so because it was <laughs> about Jesus being the Messiah, just as the gospels <laughs> had clearly spoken of as well, that Jesus was the Messiah and he came in a, he was God in the flesh, did a perfect work. Like it's just, it's just beautiful. The Bible's enough. Ellen, we, we don't need that. We don't need any of that stuff. All of those visions, they're irrelevant, yeah. right? I have context. a completed, yeah, context. I have, a, I have a completed vision through the inspired word of the Holy Spirit where I don't have to dance around people's prophecies. I can say without a doubt, that the Bible is the word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. I don't have to dance around failed prophecies or anything like that. I've got it. I, I rest in that. You know, I, I love that. I love that the Lord did that in your guys' life. It's just, it blows mm. my mind. Praise God for that. God is so yeah, good. Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Uh, so I have a question, and I appreciate that commentary, Andrew. Uh, so time-wise, linearly, I think we've covered a lot of Ellen G. White and her passing. Uh, we're going to be... Uh, we're going to tell you all in a minute where this is going. So this is sort of the sort of the ending segment of chapter one of Seventh Day Adventism. Our look, our investigation into it, our conversation about it. So time wise, uh, there what happened? Uh, so Walter Martin, uh, we'll just uh, we'll kind of head head there. Kingdom of the Cults. We've talked about that book from day one and the influence that Walter Martin has had on our ministry and even Apologia, uh, my relationship with Jeff Durbin. And just it goes, we have stories for days when it comes to listening to him and all that. So, so, so in Kingdom of the Cults, there are all these different chapters. Uh, Seventh day Adventism uh, did show, didn't show up in a definitive category like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses showed up in an appendix. We're not going to talk about that until part three. But what happened, maybe linearly, could you all explain, what do you know about the time frame in between Seventh-day Adventism up until Ellen G. White's passing, up until uh, Walter Martin uh, did what he did, that we'll talk about in part three, when he met with the representatives from Seventh-day Adventism. What did the church look like? What was the perception from Ellen G. White up until the time frame when Walter Martin was writing his book? Well, from what I know, and it's not exhaustive by any means Mm -hmm. because, you know, um, it was very historic for the most part. And for the most part, the Christian community considered Adventism to be a cult Mm -hmm. until kingdom of the cults came out. They Christianity understood that Adventism had a prophet and it had a different system of soteriology. It's soteriology was not biblical. And that was actually understood. So, um, Looking back, I know that um, the books that were printed then were very historic Adventism, very works oriented. Um, the hymns that Adventists sang, there was a hymnal that was published in the 1940s that was used through my childhood until 1984. And the Trinity was written out of a lot of the Trinitarian songs, like for example, um, Holy, Holy, Holy wrote the Trinity out instead of God in three persons, blessed Trinity, we sang God over all who reigns eternally. Um, there, there were things written out of a lot of the hymns, including a lot of the blood of Christ, anything having to do with saints being in glory. <clears throat> so it was very much uh, 
like Ellen White had designed it. But with Walter Martin, um, things there, there was like a bomb went off, actually, inside yeah. Adventism and outside. Okay. So with that being said, this is the finale of Chapter 2. It's a bit of a cliffhanger again, because <laughs> we are going to talk about that atomic bomb, that a great controversy, another one that Walter Martin was part of back in the day. So in Chapter 2, we are going to begin looking at Seventh-day Adventism through the linear timeline of Walter Martin's relationship to when he wrote the appendix to Kingdom of the Cults, the controversy that surrounded it, but also the involvement of Walter Martin's views towards the end of his ministry when he appeared on the John Ankerberg show. And if anyone is chomping at the bit and they're like, oh, I have to wait a week. Well, what you can do is you can take a look. We'll probably share links when this podcast comes out of that classic interview that's on YouTube. How long is that interview? It's a, it's a, like, was it two and a half hours? Two hours. Yes. Yeah, two hours. There's yeah. five yeah. segments, I believe. Okay. Yeah. So what we're going to be doing is that we are going to be looking at that specifically. And also we're going to be looking at what Walter Martin wrote and even the story behind what he wrote in the kingdom of the cults appendix on seven day Adventism. So stay tuned. Uh, chapter two will commence uh, next week. So with that being said, thank you all so much for listening uh, this is long awaited. Uh, we don't even need to tell you. Head to the comment section. Let us know what you thought. Let us know what you with, with what you agree. If you passionately disagree, if you think this is wrong, if you think this is incorrect, the comment section is yours. Let us know. Uh, that being said, real quickly, uh, thank you so much for both uh, for you both for coming on. Again, where can people find you if they want to find out more about you and the ministry that you do? You can go to proclamationmagazine.com and you'll find links to the weekly blogs, the emails, transcripts to our podcast, links to our podcast. There's a lot of material there. A YouTube channel. Okay. Excellent. All right. We'll talk to you all next week where we enter, where on cultists, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults and explore chapter two of this uh, very important conversation. Talk to you all next week.